13, Peter said, The church that is in Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you. And so doth Marcus, my son. I want that first part. The church that is in Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. I do want to say it's good to have our visitors today. Thank you for coming. Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. That's in the New Testament. Philippians 4, 22. Paul said, all the saints salute you. Listen very carefully. All the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are Caesar's household. Chiefly they that are Caesar's household. Peter says the church that is at Babylon salutes you. Paul says the saints that are in Caesar's house, they salute you. Uh, I want to talk to you to, today about there's a new God in Babylon. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I thank you. I honor you. I praise you. You're King of Kings today. You're Lord of Lords. I'm not going to be able to catch up with this anointing that I feel, Father, so you're just going to have to do what you do best. Roll your sleeves up and be God today. I pray, Father, that you would just remove my fingerprints, that I'd just be a conduit of your grace and mercy, and that your word would flow through me. God, I pray that you would stir and challenge this place. Let something just raise up in the hearts of the people. Let us get a fight within us. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The church that is in Babylon is salute you. The saints that are in Caesar's house, they, they salute you. It's amazing what we can read and just read right over the top of it. Not really understand what we're reading. You know, I, I sometimes I hesitate to preach certain texts of the Bible because they seem to people they seem like elementary. You know, they're not to me. I, mean, I don't think any text of the Bible is elementary. It's all powerful and it all has great truths. But you know, a lot of preachers it seems like most of their messages is on the Hebrew boys and Daniel and the lions den. I, I have my opinions on why that is, but one reason is, it's just chock full of truths, relevant truths that apply to us today. Are you with me? Do I need to give you a moment to settle? A little uneasiness in the house. I'll give you just a second to get your bearings. Remember where you're at. Right. There we go. The three Hebrew boys. There's a story behind them that needs to be brought out today, I think. And, uh, there's a, there's a, an empire, the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians conquered everything. It didn't matter who they were. They didn't even have to be opposing. They didn't have to be a threat. They didn't have to be violent. The Babylonians just expanded their borders. and They took everything in the past. Babylon was an incredible place. It was an extensive province in Central Asia. Babylon was so wealthy that their wealth was incalculable. You, you couldn't put a, a number on how much money and jewels and, and things of that nature they had because their land was so fertile. It was so rich. They could produce just about anything. Babylon sported kings with names like Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Evil Merodach. Some of those men were extremely powerful. The Babylonian kings expected you to reverence them as gods. They felt like they were gods. They felt like they were deities. And it didn't really matter because the Babylonians had hundreds. Somebody shout hundreds. Hundreds of little gods. They would go down to the temple and pay their tithes to the sun god or they would serve Marduk, the god of creation, who was over all sorts of gods. And, and they were a very wicked people, very licentious, very lewd, very sexual, and very perverted. Uh, There's this prostitution house on 
every street corner, literally, and there was male prostitutes and women prostitutes, and they had churches, temples that were designated for that type of activity. They had fertility gods and fertility goddesses particularly. And you could almost find any type flavors like Baskin Robbins, any type of god or goddess that you wanted, you could find in Babylon. When Babylon came down, the Babylonians, and they conquered the Israelites. They conquered the Hebrew people. The Babylonians did one thing that I thought was smarter than a lot of the other nations. A lot of nations, they would overcome a kingdom and they would try to attempt a genocide. They would try to destroy every single person that was there, or at least all the male children so they couldn't reproduce. The Babylonians didn't do that. They went through all the city streets and they sifted through all the young men and all the young ladies and they tried to find those that were the smartest, those that were the strongest, and those that were the most intelligent. In this sifting process, they pulled out of Israeli homes three Hebrew boys that we call Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and they pulled a fourth young man by the name of Daniel. There were many others, but the Word of God has highlighted those four young men and gave us chapters to talk about their, what happened in their life. They bring the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, down into Babylon, and they, they treat them like royalty. They, they put them through school, and they educate them, and teach them the languages of the people, and they teach them about gods and this and that. But the three Hebrew boys have a very particular and unique characteristic about them. They serve the God of heaven, and they refuse to serve anyone else. Somebody shout it out. Yeah, it's going to cause him some trouble. It's going to cause him some problems. Because the king of Babylon at this time is a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is a mortal man who thinks he's something that he's not. And so he creates this large statue, this image of himself. And he sends out a decree and he says, Everybody that, that hears the sound of the music that you've got to bow down to my image because I am God. Strange how they had to build an image big enough so the people could see because the God himself wasn't big enough. Isn't that strange? So they've got an effigy of, of Nebuchadnezzar and they get their hearts and they get their stringed instruments and they begin to play the music. And everybody, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people begin to bow down. And then you look out amongst the sea of people and there's these three teenage boys. They're not trying to be rebels. They're not trying to make a statement. They're just not going to bow to that God. They didn't ask for this. Nebuchadnezzar put them in a position to where they had to choose. I bow down to a false God or I stand before the true and living God. It was no contest. They brought these three young men who they had invested time and money into and education. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to bow. They said, oh king, they're not bowing. Our God is able to deliver us. But if he does not, he, if he does not deliver us, we somebody shout if not. They had said, if you don't bow to this God, we're going to put you in a fiery furnace. The Hebrew boy said, our God is able to quench the violence of the fire. But if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down to you. Because I would rather die for the living God than live for a fake God. And that's why they're saying it. And so he, said, he rounds up the most powerful and strongest and most experienced soldiers that he's got in his kingdom. And he says, I want you to go down to the furnace and light it up seven times hotter. And I want you to throw these three men into the fiery furnace. And they do that. They do that. And the fire is so hot. The fire is so hot that it kills the soldiers that threw the Hebrew boys into the furnace. That indicates to me that the Hebrew boys were at the mouth of that furnace. The soldiers died and they walked on in on their own. I'm sure, I'm sure that it took them a moment to realize I'm not burning. Furnace, and when your skin is supposed to melt, you 
start walking. Okay. So now they're not being burned. The king says, I saw four, I saw three loosed. That means the bands that had them tied up, the flame only succeeded in freeing them. Stay with me for a little while today. This is very important because I see across the house a lot of Christians, a lot of people that serve the living God. And you spend all of your time asking God to keep you out of the fiery furnace. And then you turn around the next breath and say, God, I want to see miracles. And God says to us today, what is the greater miracle? Is it that God would change the heart of Nebuchadnezzar and that you would never go to a fiery furnace? Or is the greater miracle that God would allow you to go to the fiery furnace and when you should have died, you didn't die. And when you should have been bound, you are now loose. What is the greater miracle? And so I would like to encourage you today is to let God do what God does. And whatever your faith takes, you'll let your faith take you that way. Because I'd rather have God in the furnace than I would have not God on the outside of the furnace. And I need to tell you tonight that somebody's watching you right now. Amen. And what should have killed you didn't kill you. And what did kill other people won't kill you. And the only difference between the Hebrew boys and the soldiers that threw them in was God. I'd rather be an old, I'd rather be a Christian today. I'd rather be a saint. I'd rather be a child of God. I'd rather be anointed. I'd rather walk in God's will and take all the fiery furnaces and whether he delivers me or not, it's all right. Because whether he's up or down, whether it's the mountain or the valley, And he says, I thought, he's already blown. He's already messed up in his head. He said, I thought I threw three men in there. Now I see four. I see a fourth. And this is fourth one. He doesn't look like the other three. He literally says, this man, this is fourth one. It looks like an angel. It's some type of gleaming, glowing individual. And he said, it's like him unto the Son of God. Oh yeah, just because you thought you threw me in the furnace doesn't mean I'm going to die. <laughs> just because you lied on me doesn't mean I'm going to fight with you and fall out. Just because you talk nasty about the church, just because I lost some money, just because I might have lost my job, devil, it doesn't mean I'm going to die because as long as I got Jesus, I said as long as I got King Jesus, as long as I got him, I don't need no Somebody shout Jesus. Yeah. And so now we see this incredible thing happen, and people are watching and they're watching you, and they want to know how you're going to go through the fire. Then we move three chapters up. Three chapters later. There is a man, a powerful man of God. He's actually prime minister. He's supposed to be a Hebrew slave. He's supposed to be a Hebrew slave. But instead of a slave, he's the prime minister in Babylon. Yes. It's a Medo-Persian empire now because Belshazzar decided to throw a party and use God's vessels for his ungodliness. And a hand came out and wrote on the wall. And he said, you're wanting. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And God told Belshazzar, this incredible kingdom that you have, this Babylonian empire that no one can stop, God says to him, he says, I'm going to take it down in one night. Woo! My God, I don't have time to preach on that. One night. So now Daniel's prime minister, this man of God, and he's got a bad habit for the devil, uh, but he's got a habit. He's got a habit. He opens up his window three times a day, and he prays to the God of heaven. Now Darius the king, the medo persian king, likes Daniel. He loves Daniel because he said Daniel's got the spirit of God above. He's got a divinity about it that I don't understand. He's got a wisdom about it that comes from somewhere else. And so Darius the Mede, the king, he sets him up as, as this prime minister over all the lands. And he's, he's governing and he's doing this and he's doing that. But, but Darius the Mede's princes, his cabinet, if you please, they don't like Daniel. They don't want Daniel to be there. He's not only not a Babylonian, but Daniel is a Hebrew. And they don't want a Hebrew telling them what to do. And so they decide that Daniel only has one fault. They can't find any weakness in Daniel at all. They searched his background. They did a background check. And they couldn't find any sin in his life. They couldn't find any inconsistency.
inconsistencies in his life. And so they said amongst themselves, I believe that we can take Daniel out because Daniel is more committed to the laws of God than he is to the laws of the, of the Medes and Persians. And they said if we can pass a decree that will cause the law of the land to go against the law of Daniel's God, they were so sure that Daniel would do the will of God that they passed a decree that made Daniel choose between the world and between the God of heaven. Now talk to me now. It wasn't because he was a sinner, because he was going to be persecuted. It was because the enemy knew that no matter what come, no matter what would go, that Daniel's going to throw his windows open three times a day, and he's going to cry out to the God of heaven, unashamed, unembarrassed. He's going to love God in the middle of a hurricane. He's going to love God when he's up, when he's prime minister, and he's going to love God if he's got to go to a dinner line. Do I
But Daniel would rather die trusting in God than to live in doubt and fear. The strangest thing happens. Listen, I'm not here to debate with you. Some people say that he was Daniel was sleeping up on the line and he was purring and humming and it was like the first vibrating bell. I don't see it like that. Is he just said the angel shut the mouth? He didn't say nothing about their appetite. Those lions wanted him. Furthermore, Darius didn't sleep all night and when he came early in the morning, Daniel was still awake. I can see the man of God as he paces the floor of the lion's den. The same God that he prayed to in the window when nobody was watching. The same God that no one cared that he prayed to in the window. And then the same God that they tried to shut him down from praying to in the window. He took him into the den of lions and he was still praying in the den of lions. And you know what I found out? I found out if nobody sees me, God's real. If the enemy comes on me like a flood, God is real. If he locks me up in a den of lions, God is real. Hold on to God. I said hold.
it's just a couple of verses been rocking my world, and I'm going I'm to get out of here. I know some of y'all want some fried chicken, and so do I. I haven't had fried chicken in two months with my wife. The Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5, 3, 13, he says in his writings, he's writing a general epistle to whoever he can get it to. He's writing it to the church, the people of God. And he says, the church in Babylon salute you. Yeah. Babylon has been vanquished for 1,500 years. <clears throat> there is no Babylon. Right. But yet Simon Peter says, the church that is in Babylon, they say hi. Yeah. Did I come over to Philippians and the Apostle Paul's writing the church in Philippi and he said all oh, and the saints that are down there in the household of Caesar they told me to tell you hi. Yeah. He said so what's that mean? What's that, what's that matter? Simon Peter's writing around 60, 65 AD. Paul is writing around 60, 65 AD. It's the time of the Roman Empire. Yeah. It's the most powerful empire that's ever been known. And it's not just the Roman Empire. And it's not just any Caesar. It's Caesar Nero. Nero, however you want to say it. It's not just any Caesar. It's Caesar Nero. You got to understand that Caesar Nero, he became in power when he was 17. And one of his first jobs, he killed his own mother. Yeah. Slew her. Nero's no doubt was demon possessed. He killed every Christian that he could find. He would take saints of God and pour hot boiling tar upon their bodies and then fasten them to poles and lift them up and light them on fire. And Christians would burn all night long while he rode through his gardens and screamed while riding a chariot. And he did that over and over and over. He took them and sold them up in calf skins and threw them in the, in the amphitheaters in the gladiatorial stage so the lions could maul them. He took Christians and crucified them and put them down the streets by the hundreds. He would decapitate them and place their heads on the streets so when you walk down the street, you would know they decapitated another Christian. Yeah. yeah. You know, he hated the Christians so bad, but he couldn't stop the God of Babylon. Woo! He hated them so bad that he hired hundreds of people. And they went throughout Rome and began to burn houses down. And they began to burn businesses down. And the old saying is, as Caesar Nero fiddled, while Rome burnt to the ground, and when the smoke cleared and the ashes fell, Nero proclaimed that it was the Christians that had burnt Rome to the ground. And then the, all, everything, all the persecution that was going on, it was intensified. It was multiplied by a thousand. And now they're tracking down every person that would name the name of Christ. Now let me talk to you. When the Apostle Paul said, the saints that are in Caesar's household, they said, hello, he's talking about Caesar Nero. That means the man that brought him his platter with his goblets of wine on it might have been a born again man of God. It means the man driving his chariot while they're trying to kill Christians was probably a Christian right inside his house. When Paul said, or Peter said, a church in Babylon, it is understood by most scholars that Simon Peter was writing from Rome. And he said, there's a church inside of Rome. They're trying to kill us. They're trying to destroy us. But in the middle of hell, in the middle of hell, in the middle of Caesar's house, in the middle of the worst dictator, the worst tyrant ever, there is faith. Yes, there's other gods, but there's a new God in Babylon, and he can hold you, he can heal you, he can deliver you. It doesn't matter where you're at, it doesn't matter what you're going through, it doesn't matter what's happening, there is a God tonight that can hold you in the middle of chaos. Help me, Holy 
in Scotland. Bloody Mary. She was on a mission for the Catholic Church. And they begin to kill every Protestant that will not convert to Catholicism. And he's a man among them, a man by the name of John Knox. John Knox is not an imposing looking fellow, but he's a powerful man of God. They incarcerate him, take him down near the river, and they pass a picture of the Pope around, and every one of those priests had to kiss the Pope. When John Knox got the picture, he threw it in the river, and he said, I'm not kissing anybody's ring but my Savior's. Somebody shout amen. amen. Scotland was underneath a heavy tyranny of the Catholic Church, and now we have a queen that's trying to destroy them. Bloody Mary, she slaughtered thousands. But do you want to know what she said about John Knox, the Scottish reformer? She said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than an army of 10,000. I'm talking to some people today. I may not be talking to everybody, but I am talking to a few people in this house. You're not looking for a way out. You're not looking for God to take care of you on the outside. You're inside the furnace right now.